Russia tomorrow. It is symbolic that at the end of the year, the world watched Vladimir Zelensky triumph in Washington. The visit of the president of the war-torn country and the reception he got refuted the arguments of experts in the Kremlin about America being fatigued and potentially abandoning its support for Ukraine. How have the past 10 months affected U.S.-Ukrainian and U.S.-Russian relations? To discuss this question, we have William Taylor, prominent analyst and former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine with us. Hello. Mr. Ambassador, our conversation with you is an attempt to review what has happened and assess the catastrophic situation. Most of all, I'd like to hear your opinion on what changes this war has led to. Is the world of today different to how it was before February 24th? I think it is different. I think it is different. I know it's different in this country and us in, in the United States. Uh, I, I suspect it's different in other democracies as well. And the one big difference is people living in democracies um, like the United States, like in Europe, um, took it for granted, took it for granted. They thought, we thought that the times for big nations invading smaller nations uh, was past. We, we thought, we thought that the time for living by some kind of rules that govern, govern uh, relations between nations um, would, would last. We, we, we thought this was somehow salvageable. Even though, of course, Russia had violated those rules in 2014, there was still this hope uh, up, through, up until February um, that these rules, uh, that democracy, could prevail. Um, it wouldn't be so hard. Well, it turns out it's hard. It turns out in order to protect democracy, in order to protect the values that, that we hold dear in terms of respect for individuals, respect for people, respect for nation sovereignty, uh, respect for sovereign nations, no matter if they're big or small, turns out we have to fight for that. And the Ukrainians are fighting for that. Um, and they are demonstrating to the rest of the democratic world, rest of the West, that, that it's not easy, that it's indeed, it's horribly hard. It's gonna make it clearer and clearer how horribly hard it is. And so the Ukrainians have taught us a lot this year about, about how, we have to fight for things that we care about and that we believe in. Uh, we have to fight for things that our children are going to value. So I, I think we've learned a lot this year. When you talk about the difference between past and present, what do you see as the reason for the unification of the West and its strong response to Russia? Everything indicated that Vladimir Putin expected a completely different reaction. He hoped they might take up a weaker position and that business as usual would continue. Clearly, he has been surprised by what happened after the invasion. How did it work out this way? I think he's probably very surprised um, at the strength of the coalition, of the alliance um, that has risen up to oppose his aggression. I think he's probably, he probably expected, as you just said, your country, you know, that, that, the West and maybe even the United States, maybe even Joe Biden was not up to it. Maybe he saw what happened uh, when President Biden decided to pull out of Afghanistan, indeed pull out of Kabul um, months before President Putin decided to invade. Maybe President Putin took the wrong message from that. Maybe he thought that the Americans were not strong enough, didn't have the stomach, didn't have the guts to oppose him when he moved. He also may have looked at Europe and found disunity there. He may have thought that, that, uh, that he could prevail. He, may have, he clearly looked at Ukraine and way underestimated. I mean, he famously thinks that Ukraine's not a real country. 
So President Putin made a lot of mistakes, and that led to a big blunder on the 24th of February um, that, uh, that I'm sure he's still reeling from, trying to figure out how to get out of it. So I think, I think he is surprised, Catherine. I think you're exactly right. How did this happen? It's a good question. I think, I, I, I do believe President Biden and the Biden administration gets a lot of credit for standing up, for assembling this alliance, this coalition, not just of NATO, not just of the EU and the rest of European nations, but East Asian allies, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Australians, the New Zealanders. He has, and, and his administration, and it's been a major effort, a major diplomatic effort to have these nations stand up and stay strong in opposition to Mr. Putin. So I think this is, I think, I think the Biden administration gets a lot of credit. You talk about the laws, Mr. Ambassador, that should likely be rewritten, because clearly the world has changed and the old post-war laws are no longer effective, as we can see in one country invading another. At the same time, the aggressor country is a member of the United Nations Security Council and as you well know, there is a Ukrainian initiative and efforts by American Congress people to exclude Russia from the UN Security Council. How realistic of a prospect do you think it is? Russia clearly no longer believes in the UN. It clearly no, no longer believes in the principles that motivated the UN or that do motivate the rest of the UN. That is these rules that you talk about, this respect for sovereignty, it's in the UN Charter, sovereignty, territorial integrity, the, the Russians, or at least the Kremlin, clearly does not believe in, in these rules and these principles that are, they've signed on to in terms of treaties and commitments, uh, and they're no longer there. So they've violated the rules. It's a test for the rest of the world um, to reestablish those rules. And one way, one way of reestablishing those rules is, frankly, to defeat Russia in Ukraine. Russia has to lose in Ukraine. You, the Ukrainians have to win in Ukraine for these rules to be reestablished. If Russia somehow wins in Ukraine, there's no hope for these rules. These, ro these rules, as you say, are gone. If Ukraine wins, if Ukraine can push the Russians back out of their country, if the if Ukrainian military can push the Russian military back across those borders into Russia, then there's hope for reestablishing these rules. And that's why the West has been providing the support to the Ukrainians, because we believe in those rules. We believe in those principles. We believe in those values. And right now, the Ukrainians are, are the ones that are actually fighting. We want them, we need them to win. Let's talk about Zelensky's visit to Washington. I read your analysis on the subject, and it's amazing, honestly, how he was received and how the American political establishment reacted. But if you realistically consider the visit, do you think it will lead to some concrete results, or is its value purely symbolic? I think there is great symbolism, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about that, but I think it's more than that. Um, I think it will result uh, in some actions, some decisions um, that the Biden administration will take. The Biden administration takes decisions in consultation with allies. Um, so, and, and that alliance, as we've already talked about, has been amazing. They've been so durable, so resistant to pressure, um, and so effective. So that alliance is important. But I think President Zelensky's visit to Washington um, has rejuvenated, re-energized, refocused um, our attention, not just in the United States, but in the whole alliance and the whole coalition um, toward additional weapons. I think this is I think this visit is going to actually result um, in some decisions made by the Biden administration in consultation with its allies about longer range, heavier, more effective, more lethal weapons uh, to enable the Ukrainians to win 
And again, that's got to be the end point. That if, if we are serious about these values, if we're serious about a world that our kids and our grandchildren are going to live in, if we're serious about having those rules apply to that world, then we need to provide the Ukrainians with the tools they need. They've not asked us for soldiers. They've only mm -hmm. asked us for the weapons, for the tools to be able to win. And so that, that's what we're after. You mentioned weapons, which I wanted to ask about. Zelensky is asking for longer range missiles that would be able to reach the territory of the Russian Federation as defined by its internationally recognized borders. In Russia, this is perceived very aggressively. There's been all kinds of statements that I'm sure you've heard from Dmitry Medvedev, Vladimir Putin and others. As I understand it, there were some doubts in the White House regarding Moscow's reaction to attacks on Russian territory with the weapons supplied. Why do you think these doubts have all but evaporated? Why is the White House all but ready to provide Ukraine with longer range missiles? A couple of things have changed. Two, two basics. One is these attacks by the Russians on civilian targets, in particular the energy sector, so that Ukrainians, Ukrainian civilians are cold and in the dark. They don't have water, they don't have electricity, they don't have heat. Um, these, the, this, is, this is clearly war criminal activity. This is genocidal activity. And that's one thing um, that I think has made the, the whole West, but the Biden administration as well, realize what, their, what the stakes are what the stakes are, how important this is. That's number one. The second reason is, as you say, Medvedev, Putin, Lavrov, members of the Duma, um, they've all been making these statements over and over and over about what might happen if the West provides weapons um, or the West provides HIMARS or the West provides Patriots or the... Ukrainians attack Crimea, or indeed, if Ukrainians attack into Russia, which they've done with their own weapons, with their own weapons, the Ukrainians have attacked into against military targets, against military air bases. The Ukrainians have gone after military targets. And what do we get from the Russians? More talk. We get more talk, more threats every time. So I think that the Biden administration is having this discussion. I know they're having this discussion and I think they'll make the decision for longer range weapons. Now, if the Biden administration wants to have a conversation with the Ukrainians about not using US weapons to fire into Russia, that's a conversation they apparently have already had. And so far, the Ukrainians that could have used some of these longer range weapons, even the ones that, we've, that they've got right now, they could have gone into Russia, they haven't. They fired into Russia with their own weapons. Now, they, and they fired into, into Crimea with their own weapons. Now, Crimea is Ukraine, let's be clear. Um, so there should be no constraints at all on Ukrainians firing into Crimea, because you, but Crimea is Ukraine, there's no doubt about that. But also I think that the, uh, the, uh, the, the area, the oblasts uh, that the Russians say they've annexed and are now actual part of, of Russia, like, like Kherson. You know, they annexed Kherson, they had a fake referendum, um, and then they passed this annexation. And the very next day, they get pushed out of Kherson, out of the city. <clears throat> so, so the Ukrainians are not deterred. Um, the Americans should not be deterred. The Americans, we should provide those weapons to enable them to win. I just keep coming back. The Ukrainians have to beat the Russians, push the Russians out of their country, and they need our support to do that. And the final question, Mr. Taylor, may be an obvious one, but it is, I think, the most important one. Various political experts and analysts predict that Russia will try to take control of Ukraine again, including Kyiv. 
It could happen in January, February or March, we don't know, but the Russian army will go ahead with such an attempt. How do you see 2023 playing out? Will the war end in this upcoming year? Katrina, it won't end that way. That's not the way this will end, because it, it will end in the, in the long run or the short run. It will end with the Ukrainians' victory. I am convinced of that. The Ukrainians will win this war one way or the other, sooner or later. It may take longer. It may take shorter. There is a lot of talk about a new Russian offensive with, yeah. these, with these newly conscripted soldiers. Um, the problem is they don't have the capability. The Russians don't seem to have the capability to do this. They've lost everywhere they've fought on the ground. They've lost in Kiev, they've lost in Kharkiv, they've lost in Izum, uh, they've lost in Liman, uh, they've lost in Kherson. Uh, they're fighting through a, a stalemate in Bakhmut. So, so the Russians have not demonstrated that they are able to do this. I don't know why anybody thinks that they're all of a sudden gonna be able to do this with conscripts or with prisoners. The Russians, apparently, uh, the, the Wagner Group um, has 10,000 regular troops and 40,000 prisoners that, that are using the fight. These are not motivated. This is, this is, you, so you can't tell me that the Russian military is suddenly going to get the, get the capability, to achieve the capability um, to have a successful offensive. They've not shown that capability at all, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse. They are running out of precision guided munitions, and they don't have the, the components to make them more. They don't have, they're not able to buy them. They have to go to the North Koreans and the Iranians um, for, for, for these kinds of weapons. And the Ukrainians are getting more and more weapons, heavier and heavier, longer range, and the Ukrainians have more volunteers than they can train. The Ukrainians are, have plenty of soldiers. They have plenty of volunteers. And the biggest thing where I think this country is, is, uh, is crucial is morale, is morale. Ukrainians know why they're fighting. We all know why they're fighting. Yeah. It's existential for them. They, if, they, if they lose, there is no Ukraine. They know why they're fighting. The Russians don't know why they're fighting. Putin has not been able to tell the Russian soldiers or the Russian people or the rest of the world why he's fighting this war. He's not been able to tell a, a coherent story. He's changed his story. He doesn't have a good story. It's unprovoked. There's no rationale for this invasion. So for all those reasons, the Ukrainians will win, I am convinced. It may take longer, it may take shorter. They may break through in the next several months before the Russians are able to mount a new offensive. The Ukrainians might break through now and that could hasten the day. And then the Russian people will have to decide. Thank you very much. It's been fascinating as usual. We operated in Russia for 12 years and the government tried to get rid of us three times. They got us on the sixth day of the war in Ukraine. We left Russia, but we kept going. We have now decided to tell the truth about Russia, the war, and Russian society in English as well. Kherson is Putin's third major defeat in a row. What is wrong with the Russian army? Stories no one else can tell you. Hear it right from the source. Subscribe to our channel.